Mayor Blake stood watching the road, waiting for signs of the Lord's approach. He had received a letter from the Lord, a response to the events surrounding the disappearance of Nathan and Rudolph, stating that he would arrive around noon on this day. Of course, that letter had been sent before Drew vanished in the night. At last, the banners of the king became visible over the crest of the hill, soon followed by mounted guards, then a carriage flying the Lord's heraldry, and followed by more mounted guards. The South Road had been attacked by bandits a few times over the last year, and clearly the Lord was taking no risks. Accompanied by no less than a dozen armoured guards, each mounted on armoured horses. As the last of the guards crested the hill, the banner of the Lord's Wizard became visible, soon revealing another carriage and a half dozen more mounted soldiers, this time wearing the Wizard's heraldry. Wesley didn't trust wizards. They were just witches that went to college. How that stopped them being dangerous was a mystery, and he hated mysteries. Now that he could see them, he ran to the tavern, calling out to the staff to ready things. The tavern was closed for regular customers today, so it would be clean and comfortable for the Lord and his retinue. He wanted to make sure everything was ready before they entered. The top of the hill was still an hour away at the speed of the carriages, not really moving faster than a walk. So Wesley busied himself, pouring a glass of his finest wine for the Lord and Wizard as the sound of the carriages reached the tavern's rear. The wine ready, he headed for the stables out back, arriving just in time to see the door to the Lord's carriage open, the driver tending to the horses while the footman helped the Lord's daughter down. The carriage lolled from side to side as her moderate bulk dropped to the hay-strewn ground. Once she was clear of the door, Lord Buckheim emerged, his head leaning out to look at the wizard's coach, drawing the mayor's attention as well. The wizard's coach was far more expensive and decorated. Its two white horses pulled it without a driver. The carriage didn't even have a seat for one. The door opened as the two of them looked on, causing the Lord to duck back into the velvet depths of his own. Long, elegant legs and flowing robes began to emerge from the carriage, revealing a remarkably tall woman, her hair dappled by sunlight despite the clouds, and the folds of her robes flickering with flame as though her undergarments were ablaze. Once she had emerged, she looked up at the sky and began to speak though Wesley could not understand the words, their strange sounds barely human in form, more similar to the screeching of tortured rats or birds. The words made the air warm, pushing a breeze through the stables. As she uttered the last sound, the clouds above flashed with strange light, which seemed to satisfy the Lord, emerging from his carriage a moment later. During this strange ritual, the Lord's daughter had already made her way into the tavern, apparently not the least bit concerned or impressed by the magical workings of her travelling companion. My Lord Buckheim, welcome to Wicken Mill. Wesley bowed as he spoke, ignoring the smell of the hay at that range, before rising again. There is wine and food inside. Lord Buckheim wafted past him directly for the wizard, who was now giving detailed instructions to Nevin, the stable hand and Wesley's second son. The Lord waited patiently for her to finish instructions, soon engaged in whispers with her. Two minutes of waiting patiently drifted by, before the Lord and Wizard finished their huddle and returned to Wesley. Blake, uh, this is the Wizard Shara, the Lord gestured between them as he made the introduction. Welcome to Wiccan Mill. He turned to the door, gesturing toward it. Wine and food have been prepared, if you will follow me. Wesley turned and opened the door. Thank you. The wizard's voice was very normal now, not the strange speech of earlier, even having a hint of rustic tone to it. Her impressive height forced her to duck under the lintel as she entered, followed by the mare. Once they were inside, Wesley led them to the best table in the bar, 
where the Lord's daughter was already helping herself to roasted chicken and duck, seemingly disinterested in the vegetables or fruits. Mayor Blake pulled a chair out for the wizard as the Lord took a seat, and she slid into it, smiling. Do you have tea or pressed fruit juice? I don't imbibe alcohol. Of course, we have blackberry juice, or we can make nettle, elderflower, or ginger tea. Ginger tea sounds lovely. Now that she was settled, the Lord Staff had entered the bar, filling two other tables, and placed orders for food, a sentiment that the Lord and Wizard seemed to share, both tucking in to the banquet on offer. After a few vicious bites of a duck leg, the Lord gestured to a seat at the table, swallowing the meat before speaking. You mentioned a dancing bush and missing kids in your letter. It was not a question, clearly a statement, but Wesley knew it was an invitation to speak. Yes, my lord. Since I sent the letter, another boy has vanished, though we believe he ran away. Tea arrived in a small black iron pot, the bar's finest cups laid out around it, and a jar of honey set close by. Why do you think that? Shara inquired. Wesley turned his attention to her. Her plate had a selection of fruit and cheese on it, and she was holding a slice of matured cheese, topped with a sliver of pear. Several items were taken, including his boots and a hatchet. Satisfied with the reasoning, she turned to her meal. We burned the area of dancing bushes. It seemed to work, but two boys vanished before we knew it was there. Having poured herself some tea, Wesley decided to claim the second glass of wine, taking a good swallow of the fine drink. Through duck and turnip, the Lord sputtered out, You followed the crown recommendations, that's good. He nodded as another bite of duck went down. I should like to see this place before the sun sets. Would that be possible? Of course, Shara. It's an hour or so's walk through the woods. I can show you the way. Without another word, the wizard rose from her seat, looking expectedly at the mare. Turning to the lord, Wesley didn't even get the chance to speak, being waved off by him as he swallowed another bite. His appetite no less than the little round daughter he had with him. Quickly donning a cloak and changing into some boots, Wesley led her out of the tavern and off toward the woods. As soon as they emerged from the tavern, Two of her guards, now on foot, were flanking. He didn't know what to say to a wizard, nor did he have any idea what she may care to discuss. So Wesley walked in silence, leading the small party to the woods and the sight of their disappearances. A crisp layer of snow covered the ground all the way to the forest, where the trees had broken up the snowfall leaving patches beneath the evergreen boughs where no snow had fallen. As they approached the grove of bushes, the wizard began to mumble, though Wesley was not able to make out anything he recognised among the sounds. A ring of fallen trees surrounded the grove, chopped down to limit the spread of the flames, each showing a burned and blackened side to the bushes, though both the bushes and enclosing trees showed no sign of the blaze. Here it is, he gestured to the grove, not willing to enter the area. Shara stopped at the edge as well, her voice rising to the strange alto she had spoken before, quickly producing results. The ground began to exude rising strands of flickering, ever-changing runes, glowing the colour of embers. They began to sway and break free from the ground. Dancing around the bushes, they began to take form, soon rendering a runic pattern in the shape of Nathan, Rudolph and Drew. Wesley watched their runic ghosts play out a silent scene. They made no sound, but their words floated from their mouths, runes taking the shape of letters. As the Nathan rendition struck the bush, the runes flickered violently, rushing into the ground. An explosion of new ones poured out of the bush, infecting others and causing the Drew ghost to flee in terror. Rudolph had cried out, 
reaching his hand toward where Nathan had been, when a stream of runes from the bush struck his hand, causing the ghostly hand to fade, becoming nearly invisible. The impact caused Rudolph to run in panic, charging off into the depths of the forest. The runes began to flicker wildly, racing around the scene, when he noticed the wizard was mumbling again. Moments later, the runes slowed and rendered new ghosts. This time they were of him, Drew, and a dozen men from the village. He watched the events play out, a perfect mirror of his own memories. Runes danced like flames as great torrents of them swirled across the ground, causing the wizard to produce a quill and paper from her robes. As the second scene reached its conclusion, she began to mutter again, causing another mad swirl of shapes before they slowed and formed a strange ellipse. Contained within it was the ghost of some strange monster. Its four arms and animalistic legs made him shudder. Some sort of demon, he imagined. At the edge of the area, two ghosts appeared. That of Drew and Rudolph, still bearing a translucent arm, though his attire and bow suggested he had been living in the woods for months. The boys made an assault on the demon, forcing it to flee. With little hesitation, both of them gave chase. The scene made Wesley swell with pride. They had acted like men, protecting the village from a demon. Perhaps they would return one day, with tales of slaying them. The mumbling returned and the patterns moved on, winding to the moment he and Shara arrived. And for an instant, he saw her rendered as a runic ghost. The blazing fury of her hair and robes made majestic and unnerving by their rendition. With a final mumble, the runes faded back into the soil, her quill deftly scribbling notes under her expert direction. Mayor Blake, this place is a weak spot, is very valuable and dangerous. As she finished speaking, her quill came to a stop, drifting away from the page. Weak spot? It is a hall in the world, she replied, still staring at the bushes as though she were in a contest of wills with them. A hole? To where? Snatching the quill out of the air, she returned it and the notes to the folds of her clothing. Other worlds, 